In this video, we're going to talk about the Western power that had the greatest impact on China during its modern history. And here I refer to Japan. I place the word Western in scare quotes, both to indicate that it's a little strange to refer to Japan as part of East Asia as a Western country, but also to anticipate something which comes up in the course of the late 19th century and the early 20th century, which is that during its modernization efforts, Japan and leading Japanese statesmen often began to think of themselves and of the Japanese nation state as a Western power, either in a formal sense or at least as the equivalent of an industrialized Western power. So in that light, I think for our purposes, it's useful to think of Japan as one of the most influential Western powers in the history of modern China. So let's get started. At roughly the same time that the Qing is undertaking its Tongzhi Restoration, Japan is undertaking something referred to as the Meiji Restoration. This was an aggressive campaign of strategic Westernization, one that resembled in part what we've seen in the Qing, but in many ways went far beyond what China would undertake. The guiding policy of modernization for Japan was to maintain a balance between Western technology and what was referred to as Eastern spirit, Wakan Yosai. In 1871, an official Japanese envoy known as the Iwakura Mission traveled to Europe and the United States on a three-year fact-finding mission essentially to collect information on legal, economic, political, and military infrastructures and practices in the Euro-American world to help enhance a Japanese state-led policy of rich country, strong army. At the vanguard of this was uh, something known as the Japanese Enlightenment figures, and these were figures such as Fukuzawa Yukichi, Kato Hiroyuki, and others. And they had this journal, which uh, known as Meiroku Zashi, which was one of the leading spokespersons of, of the modernization movement. Over this period, the Meiji state established a national currency. It established a bicameral legislation. It initiated the construction of a national railway. It promoted a state constitution. And it began to renegotiate the unequal treaties that Western powers had forced upon Japan, much like they were forcing them upon China. In an earlier video, I made reference to Commodore Perry, dispatched from the United States to Japan in the mid-1850s, who was tasked with forcing open Japan's economy by military force if necessary. And what followed was a period of unequal treaties with Japan that is somewhat similar to what we see with the unequal treaties period for China. A major focus for Japanese modernizers was military modernization. In the wake of the Franco-Prussian War in Europe and the formation of a German state, Germany became a model for Japanese modernization of its army, for example. The political demographic makeup of Japan underwent significant changes as well. For example, the samurai class was systematically eroded beginning around this point. A hefty percentage of state revenues had been dedicated to essentially stipends for samurai warriors until state authorities in Japan began to tax these stipends in 1873 and then to replace them in 1874 with government bonds. It was the creation of a conscript army in Japan, however, that elicited the most violent reaction from samurai, insofar as the Meiji Japanese state was effectively wresting control of the legitimate use of violence from these samurai and creating a, a class of military that samurai thought had no, no right to bear arms. The samurai rose up in rebellion against the Japanese state and were crushed in 1877. Intriguingly, although we will see in the Second World War the Japanese state refer to Bushido, the way of the warrior, and all of this kind of romanticization of samurai ethics and Bushido ethics, ironically, 
this fascination and promotion of Bushido and samurai ethics was coming at precisely the moment when the samurai as a class were being completely dismantled. It's a little bit like we see in the United States when there's all this fetishization of cowboys and all of that kind of Western nonsense at precisely the time that cowboys were being systematically kind of eroded and disenfranchised as a group in America. So they were disenfranchised and dissolved and then turned into a kind of romantic mythology. Employing its modernized military, the Japanese state undertook territorial expansion and conquest and consolidation. And this is roughly at the same time that Russia, for example, is expanding into Siberia uh, and into Mongolia and northern Manch Manchuria. So there is a growing potential for conflict not only between Japan and China, that is the Meiji state and the Qing state, but also between the Meiji Japanese state and the Russian Empire. As we will see more clearly in the next set of videos, the rise of Japan as a major power in the 19th century was one of the defining geopolitical stories in the history of modern China. We cannot understand modern China without understanding the rise of Japan.